so you probably have heard of the Witcher franchise. If you were like me, you had friends who tried to upsell you the Witcher 3 game. And this game alone is probably why we are here today, discussing a TV show adaptation of the Witcher. You see, what happened was that when this game was released, it became such a huge hit that it made the source material, aka the books upon which the game was based, surge in their popularity. And because of the sudden popularity, the Polish books written by Andrzej Sapkowski appeared under Netflix's radar, and this spawned the whole Witcher universe on the platform, and at some point it was even called the Game of Thrones of Netflix. What I must note is that this show came in a really favorable timing, since Game of Thrones was ending. People were getting hungry for the next big political fantasy series, and The Witcher happened to be the perfect candidate to fill in that void. All around, it was the perfect move on behalf of Netflix. The game fans were down to watch it, and after the author of the books claimed that Henry Cavill was the definitive Geralt of Rivia, the book fans also seemed to be on board. The hype train seemed to gain so much traction that the show was just destined to become big. I mean, there was this one time when the show was being memed on by the internet, when Netflix decided to tease the show by putting Henry Cavill in a party city wig. <laughs> He needs some milk! And that went as well as you would expect. But even despite all that, once the show did drop on Netflix, it really became a hit with the audiences. Season 1 broke records, and critics raved about how supposedly good it was. Then season 2 hit, and once again it broke records. It even became one of Netflix's most watched TV shows ever at some point. Before season 2 was released, The Witcher TV show was already renewed for the third season. They also released an animated movie set in the universe called The Nightmare of the Wolf, and also they announced prequel miniseries Blood Origin. All in all, it seems like like the Witcher franchise has a bright future ahead. But you see, not everyone was satisfied. This is indeed a tale of two perspectives. What do I mean by this? Well, whenever something is adapted from any source material, there is always a split into two camps. And the first camp includes all the people who have read the source material. In Witcher's case, that is the book series written by Sapkowski. And the second camp includes all the people who haven't read the books. And people who are coming into the franchise with fresh eyes. You can even make the room for a third camp, aka for the people who played the games, but for this video they are irrelevant. And this divide always exists when something is adapted. This is indeed a tale as old as time. There are some cases where book fans like the adaptation, but a lot of book fans usually prefer the books. Some book fans also can be absolute purists and hate the adaptation without giving it a chance, and some are vocal about it. And this is why the opinions of book fans are usually dismissed, and a lot of discourse around this topic can be broken down like this. The book readers yell, the books were better, and all the people who didn't read yell back, shut up this is its own thing, nobody fucking cares, burn the books. But this divide between the two camps can be directly relative to the changes adaptations make to the books. The more is changed, the bigger is the divide. And in the case of The Witcher, it isn't just a gap, it is a whole Grand Canyon. And this is why The Witcher TV show is divisive in its nature. And that I think is very fascinating, because if you delve deeper into The Witcher, you can actually see how this divide plays out. Season 1 had a moderate amount of changes, but they weren't too great groundbreaking, and they didn't seem to threaten the book fans too much, hence why it was generally well received. The divide was there, but it was small, but season 2 turned it up to the max, and the changes became a very big concern to the book readers. Like, this season really went all out and made it almost unrecognizable in comparison to the source material, hence why season 2 was so polarizing within the fanbase. Now, here's the thing. I have actually been on both sides of these camps, but at different points in time. You see, I watched the first season knowing almost nothing about the franchise. I had played the game like once or twice, but that doesn't really count since I couldn't remember anything from them. And then, after season 1, I decided to buy the entire book series. And I read some of the books, but not all just yet. But before season 2 even aired, I managed to get through the source material of the season, aka the Blood of Elves, as well as the Time of Contempt. So I had a general idea of what was coming and how it would tie into the future of the series. And this fact definitely altered my viewing experience. I remember after finishing the second season, I was texting a friend, full of rage by the way, about how awful I found the second season to be. But after cooling down, I had the epiphany. I essentially became a book purist, who zealously trashed the show because it was different. But I decided to take a few steps back, and to actually delve deeper as to what exactly went wrong with the show. Because in my opinion, this discourse must be had, because the book fans sometimes don't understand those who didn't read the books, and the non-readers are way too dismissive of the book fans. So for the sake of productivity and clarity, this is how I plan 
plan on approaching the show through two main lenses. The lens of a newcomer who is disconnected from the source material and the lens of a person who has read the books. And I want to do this because I do believe that the show fails in both regards, as an adaptation and as its own thing. And honestly, I am just sick of seeing critics mindlessly raving about the show when it has some very obvious flaws. So first, we will walk through the two seasons with a newcomer's perspective. I will dissect them without the books in mind, take it for what it is and see how it holds up. Our first stop is season 1. Generally speaking, I kind of like the first season, but this comes with a little bit of bias. There was quite a lot of criticism about the three different timelines being mixed in and the show jumping around in time, and honestly, I wasn't too mad about that. I really like the idea of non-linear storytelling, but hey, that's just me. I just really love to see the stuff in media. I just like being confused, I guess. So first, allow me to break down the structure of season 1. Basically, we have three characters that we follow. Geralt of Rivia, Yennefer of Engeberg, and Cyrilla of Sintra. Let's consider Cyrilla's storyline as the present day. So Yennefer's storyline begins about 60 years before the present day, and Geralt's storyline begins about 40 years before the present day. This graph, provided by The Witcher TV does a great job at displaying the relations of storylines in the time frame. So basically, the show has the job of somehow connecting these storylines into a single cohesive narrative. And for the most part, I didn't mind how they did it, since I actually liked figuring out when the stuff was happening and how it related to the overall narrative, but this way of storytelling wasn't without its problems. The most glaring and easiest issue to catch is probably Yaskir. I mean, according to the timeline, Yaskir and Geralt first meet about 20 years before the present day, and the last time Geralt sees Yaskir is about near the present day. Now, let's compare the appearance of Yaskir 20 years ago and in the present day. Doesn't he just look like he's 20 years older? Like, come on now. Like, at least give him wrinkles or something? And I can understand Geralt not aging since he's a witcher, and I can understand Yennefer not aging since she's a mage. But this dude is just a bard, yet somehow he's immortal. But this is probably the least offensive problem that stems from the show's structure. More of the more major issues can be seen in the relationship between Yennefer and Geralt. When I first watched it, I kind of rooted for them, but still I found their story to be a little bit off, and that is because we got only a couple of scenes with the two of them before they decided to, well, consummate. And not gonna lie, to me this felt a bit too soon and not earned. And why was that, you might ask? I believe that there is a bit of a disconnect between what we, the audience, are shown and what has happened within the show's universe. You see, for me, it seemed like they just met in an episode or two before and they hadn't spent that much time together, but within the show's chronology, there are years that have passed between the episodes. Hence, they have known each other for longer than the audience might realize. And because of the nature of the storytelling, the show tends to slip into telling instead of showing. For example, episode 5 ends with Yennefer and Geralt together, but then episode 6 comes around and through exposition we found out that the couple had split up. And during my first watch I was confused as to what the hell had happened, because the show for some unknown reason decided to skip a big part of their relationship. Apparently what had happened was that they did spend some time together, but Geralt left Yennefer, and you would think that this should be a defining moment in their relationship. But for a moment moment that was this important, it wasn't even shown. And we only find out about this through dialogue, and it kind of ends up having zero impact or depth, so in the universe itself it would make sense for them to have feelings. But that becomes irrelevant to the audience since we don't see that, and therefore this relationship ends up feeling forced instead of organic. The solution would have been to just dedicate more screen time to explore that, but instead we get a lot of it dedicated to Cyrilla's storyline, and her whole thing was probably the least compelling part of the season. It just felt overstretched. The whole storyline occurs over the span of two weeks, and for those two weeks, we can see her mostly running away, and I found myself skipping a lot of these parts. The most compelling storyline for me was probably Yennefer's. Again, I am a bit biased here, since I am a sucker for magic in media, but what I thought was unique was her origin story, aka her being a hunchback. I just hadn't ever seen that done before, and I thought it was very interesting. But there was probably one scene that I disliked the most in her storyline. It's that one scene where she returns to her school, Aratuza, and then, I kid you not, she proceeds drugging the underage students. 
Like not only is she hosting orgies, Yennefer is also in Arco Baroness, and I also love it that this scene doesn't even have a purpose. My official headcanon is that we have this scene to find out that she can basically cook meth in her own bathtub. And don't you just love to go to your former alma mater and drug young girls? Like what's next? A cuddle puddle organized by Geralt? There were more stupid moments, like when that dude who is secretly a dragon and his goons fall off the edge of a cliff. I just couldn't help but laugh. Everything about that moment was just way too funny. But overall, I also like Geralt's storyline. And that little twist where we find out that he was actually present during the fall of Sintra, that was just chef's guess. I also found myself liking the character of Tissaia de Vries. I don't know what it was about her, but she really stood out to me. I mean, it is probably the fact that on the surface, she seems like a cold woman. But during her conversations with Yennefer, we get hints that there is something deeper beneath that coldness. I just find that really compelling and endearing. The acting was also generally great. Like Henry Cavill is indeed my definitive Geralt of Rivia. I also very much like the actress who portrayed Yennefer. But what I thought was absolutely perfect about season 1 was the goddamn music. I mean, are you fucking kidding me? The music was so good. Like for me it was really unique. I had never heard anything like that before and my mind was literally blown. When the last rose of Sintra came on, I had chills it was so good. The Witcher theme, Yennefer's theme, even the song of the white wolf, all of them were absolute bangers. Like the music really brought it together sometimes and made everything so much more epic. Another thing that I liked, and I recognize that I am probably the minority here, were the costumes. Like Yennefer's outfits were mostly amazing. I liked that they went with more modern looks sometimes. Of course, I am not talking about the boob dress Yennefer had during the last episode. And no, I am not in fact including the trash bag Nilfgaardian armor. Don't worry, I'm not that far gone. Now let's hop over to season 2. And immediately one of my disappointments was the music. Joseph Trapanese did not match the energy of season 1's composers, which is a bit sad considering that I liked his work in Shadow and Bone. The music this time around felt more generic and not as unique. Another thing that I saw a lot of praise for but did not like myself was the costumes. And I completely understand that they aimed for the medieval aesthetic. But to me, the costumes just looked tackier. But these things are just there to facilitate the story. And I don't know about you, but the story of the second season felt messier than season 1. Like season 2 finally had linear storytelling, but it was still all over the place. In season 1, for the most part, we followed three main characters. And we had some stretches when we followed Nilfgaard. But the show already struggled to balance these storylines, so it isn't a surprise that season 2 struggled even more. Because now, we had to follow the stuff at Kaer Morhen with Geralt, Ciri and also Triss. We also followed Yennefer, the stuff with Francesca and Fringilla, as well as the stuff with Istrid. This time around there was far more happening and it became crowded, and therefore the writing faltered to a lower level. And I think the most glaring example of this comes from the whole deal with Vesemir and Ciri. Essentially what happens there is that Ciri's blood can suddenly be used to create more witchers, and this criticism will not come from my love for the books, don't worry. My problem with this is that the storyline backpedals on what was established in season 1. Season 1 takes its time to explain that it is impossible to make more witchers, since they don't have the mutagens needed. And that makes Geralt a bit of a novelty, one of the last of the witchers. And this whole concept ties back to the sacking of Kaer Morhen, as well as the reputation of the witchers in the continent. The sacking of Kaer Morhen is a pivotal event for the witchers, which occurred because of the prejudice that people had against witchers. And one of the outcomes is that they cannot produce more witchers. They are essentially seen as monsters who are going extinct. And this makes them unusual and scarce. But in season 2 it turns out that the mutagen can be made from Cyrilla's blood. I think there was virtually no reason to try and add a way to create more witchers, because now, as long as Ciri is around, they will have a way to create more mutagens. But why? What for? So it's like, are we normalizing the witchers now? And also, doesn't this take away from the main themes of the show? Geralt being the outcast and stuff? If they create more witchers, is he really an outcast anymore? This only exists for cheap drama points instead of something meaningful. Another instance of weird writing choices was the whole escape from 
from Kahir's execution by Yennefer and Kahir. Like, they somehow just managed to get out of there and nobody did shit about it. Like, a ton of monarchs were gathered at the same place and somehow it wasn't crawling with guards? Get out of here with that logic. This season is also haunted by some relationships being underdeveloped. Yennefer and Geralt still don't feel right together. Also, Francesca and Fringilla being allies didn't really work for me. And also, what is now really weird is the whole dynamic between Geralt, Ciri and Yennefer. Yennefer almost sacrificed Ciri for her powers and I just really don't see them just sitting together peacefully at the end like a family. But I also noticed something else about the show. What really binds the two seasons isn't only the characters and the story, but also their shared problems. And the first thing that I'd like to point out is that the show really likes using cop-outs. Tools that allow them to play God and make the plot go wherever they want it to go. Now what do I mean by this? Okay, so in season 1 we had this. Destiny. 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 Destiny can go f And then in season 2 we had this. And the path forward will be harder still. But I can help you. And make your ask. To see your child live. You must live first amongst men. And these two things are essentially an excuse for the writers. In season 1 you could give it a pass. Like yeah, sure, Destiny isn't the most optimal device to use, but still it served its purpose in season 1. It got the characters to the places where they needed to be, to places where they could actually start the Witcher saga, but then the writers went ahead and invented something else, just so they could have an excuse to say why certain things were happening in the show. And it is actually more hilarious the second time around. Why? Because in season 1 Destiny worked in mysterious ways, in silence. But in season 2, the Deathless Mother literally whispered shit into characters' heads. It was like the writers themselves were directly telling characters what to do. Think about it. We now officially have two seasons in a row, where the characters are being directly told to do something to lead to an outcome the writers want. And this is just ridiculous, because 1. This shows that the writers are unable to write a plot without finding a way to be gods. The plot just cannot progress organically, can it? And 2. It undermines the characters somewhat, since this whole Destiny and Deathless Mother stuff takes away their agency. It feels like the characters characters don't have that much of a grip over the plot, since either way it's Destiny and Geralt will always end up caring for Ciri and yada yada yada, and Fringilla will become a girl boss because the Deathless Mother said so. They might as well could have called the Deathless Mother Wallet Destiny Mare, because she's basically the same thing, but stupider. Not to mention, the dialogue in the show is sometimes borderline cringe. So suddenly we get gems like these. The South is the South. What happened with you? Your motherfucker goat? You're a dick. With balls. Did your motherfucker snowman? And the Emmy goes to The Witcher. <laughs> And also, someone in the writer's room has had the bright idea to drop the F-bombs in the most random places, somehow thinking that it makes the characters sound cool and edgy. And I would totally forgive all of these F-bombs if they at least slipped in an occasional Oh kurva! It really does sound like the material in both seasons came from the same writer's room, but in the worst way possible. Points for consistency, I guess. Another issue I had is that the show was a bit sloppy in its lore. The clearest example of this is in the last episode of season 1, when Fringilla is confronted by Tissaia. Fringilla throws this mist at her, powder, I don't know, and then she says... Demeritium. And I was like... Okay, go on. What is it? The show actually doesn't explain what it is. From the sounds of it, it sounds serious, but like, is it a paralytic? Is it a toxic gas? I actually had to google what it was to figure it out. This specific example is small, but it portrays this problem perfectly. This show is riddled with people throwing around random names of cities and kingdoms, as well as the names of kings and emperors, but to the general viewer, this can become really tedious, because it feels like you are the dumb one for not knowing what those things are. Meanwhile, the show does very little to explain all of this lore. And some of you might be thinking, that's how it was in the books. But trust me, we will return to this issue a bit later. Okay, so now, let's cross into the dark side. Let's dust off our bookshelves and flip open our copies of the Witcher books. And let's look at the show through the perspective of the book readers. Okay, so season 1 was adapted from the two short story collections, The Last Wish and The Sword of Destiny. Because of their format, these stories take place all over the continent and all over across the timeline. 
and I do think that the way they adapted the stories was creative. There were also spots where the show needed to extrapolate some of the events mentioned in the books, which came from the retellings of other characters. An example of this is the Battle of the Sodden Hill. This event itself is not in the books, and in some places I kind of liked how they adapted this event. Like, there is this one moment I explicitly remember. There was a character named Coral, and in the book she was described looking like a stump after the battle, aka her body was that mutilated, and the show took that kind of literally, and that I actually liked. But what the Battle of the Sodden Hill is also a good example of, is of the show downgrading a lot of the material from the books. You see, from the books I had imagined the fight to be much more epic, but in the show it was sort of small. Granted, they had to work with the restraints of budgeting, they are in different mediums and such, but they also downgraded a lot of stuff like character development and relationships. I already talked why Yennefer and Geralt's relationship in the show sucks, and all I can add is that their relationship from season 1 is explored far better in the books, and this downgrading also applies to Geralt and Ciri. If you didn't know, their meeting at the end of season 1 wasn't the first time they met in the books. In the short story Sword of Destiny, they actually spent some time together and got to know one another. And this isn't the only example of the show doing this, there is plenty, but what they also did is that they decided to cut out a lot of meaning and depth from the stories, and this particular topic has already been discussed widely. There are actually plenty of videos explaining this. The most prominent example of this is with Renfri. Her story had much more depth in the short story The Lesser Evil. I would really recommend reading the short story for yourself, because the show doesn't really do it justice. And for now, that is pretty much it for season 1. Let's cross over to season 2. Okay, so season 2 is based on the Blood of Elves. As I have mentioned, I've read it. I remember around the time of season 1, the showrunner talking about seven season plan for the show. Okay, so if you are not aware, the main Witcher saga consists of five books. The first season was based on the two books before the Witcher saga, and there is one other book, aka the Season of Storms, but chronologically it is already too late to adapt it. So by using some logic, we can deduce that they want to use five books for six seasons, and that would be great and all, but after reading The Blood of Elves, I remembered this plan, and I was left wondering, wait what? No shade to Mr. Sapkowski here, but Blood of Elves is rather... uneventful? Not to say that it was bad, it wasn't, but it mainly consisted of character development and slower moments, and it wasn't really enough to make an entire season out of it. So having this information I was already concerned, because they had less books than seasons, and this meant that they would need to do a lot of stretching to make the plan work, and they really did not make it work, like, at all. <laughs> I was absolutely appalled after seeing the second season, and without a doubt, the season's high point was episode 1, because really it felt like it still belonged in season 1, but everything after episode 1 was just freefall into oblivion, and my thoughts on second season are incoherent, but that is probably because the whole season is incoherent, but to sum up the second season, everything was awful. Like, I cannot for the life of me point out a storyline that I actually loved. I think it is already clear that this season commits a lot of sins, especially against the books, but the biggest most cardinal sin is what they did to my favorite moment in the book. Okay, so in the Blood of Elves, there is a very, very nicely written letter in which Yennefer is writing to Geralt, and it essentially consists of her making fun of him. Like, the letter encapsulated Yennefer's pettiness beautifully, and I still read it from time to time. It was so perfect. And they turned it into this? This is my... Dear friend. Dear friend. I am still so mad over it. And this whole season was just like that. There was so much good writing from the books being replaced by shit. But as a person who has read the books, this wasn't the only infuriating thing, obviously. And that thing is the whole character of Yennefer. The show did her so dirty, and they messed up the most important relationships she had. That is the relationships between her and Geralt, as well as her and Ciri. And their whole family dynamic is now messed up. I remember there was a scene in the Time of Contempt, right at the end of chapter 2, it's where Yennefer and Geralt are talking, and Ciri is watching them from afar. Yennefer is yelling at him, gesturing wildly, and he just listens. And Ciri is watching them as if she is watching her parents fight. And that whole scene, to me, was probably the best encapsulation of their dynamic. Yennefer is very much the chaotic one in their relationship. She is the one who usually takes charge, whilst Geralt is passive and a bit clueless. But shows Yennefer doesn't feel like she is the same character from the books. She feels very 
entertainment comparison. So already this dynamic is not there. Cyrilla and Yennefer also don't feel as close because the show doesn't give the time for them to be together. But the book dynamic is further destroyed when it shows Yennefer almost sacrifices Ciri for Deathless Mother. This alone puts her in contention with both Geralt and Ciri. So therefore all of the dynamics and relationships from the books are destroyed between these characters. Vesemir is a victim of this too. If you don't believe me, they made him almost test a mutagen on Ciri, knowing damn well what it could potentially do to Ciri and how much she meant to Geralt. And this came about because the writers decided to add their own original content alongside the adapted material. And here I can give them a tiny bit benefit of the doubt, because it was very clear that the book didn't have enough material to make it into an 8 episode season, but they could have covered more short stories, or at least taken time of contempt to adapt into season 2. It isn't like they didn't have any choice, they weren't forced to do it. They made the conscious choice to add more material, and almost all of the additional material is garbage. The one not that bad idea was the Deathless Mother. I had noticed some people dragging the show for including her, but hear me out on this. The idea of the Deathless Mother herself is actually very fitting in the Witcher lore, and I sort of like that they thought of that, but I am actually more than a little biased on this. Okay, now here is some lore about me for you. I come from a small European country called Lithuania, which happens to be right next to Poland, and we have once been a commonwealth. Okay, so anyways, the point here is that Lithuania has some similar cultural motives in fairy tales and stories to Poland. Okay, so Poland is considered a Slavic country, and if you may or may not know, the Deathless Mother is based on Baba Yaga, a supernatural being from Slavic folklore. And as it happens, we Lithuanians also have something very similar. Only Lithuanian fairy tales, it is a witch on a broom who lives in a house that stands on a chicken's leg. So I must admit that when I saw the Deathless Mother and her little hut, I got a little excited. You see, as it is, there is not a lot of representation of other parts of Europe besides the English medieval fantasy. So naturally seeing something like The Witcher become mainstream was already pretty mind-boggling. But seeing something like the Deathless Mother who has a close connection to my own culture was just next level. I don't know how to describe it, but when you are from a small country, getting a bit of a shout-out from a big show like this is always great. It's like how I still can't get over the fact that some characters in Witcher 3 are based on the Dukes of Lithuania, like Olgerd von Everek is a reference to the Grand Duke Algirdas, and Kestatis von Everek is a reference to the Grand Duke Kestutis. I'm sorry, I'm geeking out, but I feel like I had to share this. It's just that when you come from a place that is so underrepresented in mainstream media, these things really stick with you, hence why I low-key like the idea of this character, but either way the execution sucked, so... Thanks Witcher and Netflix. Another big departure that I can think of comes from them revealing who Emir is this soon, and I can sort of see why they did this. The showrunner herself has commented that they couldn't hide this identity for long because it would be logistically difficult, and I get that, I really do, but at least wait for another season or something. This was way too soon. I mean, I can see another reason why they did this, but once again we will return to this later. So having explained all of this, it really isn't difficult to see why the fans are upset. All of this agitation can be explained by a simple principle. If something isn't broken then don't fix it. Don't let anyone fool you. This isn't the case of Game of Thrones at all. The books were long done before the adaptation even came to be. The story was completed. This was such a good advantage over Game of Thrones that The Witcher had. So why would anyone decide to try and change it? And for the worse I might add, but you have come this far into the video, endured the storm of shit along with me, climb this Mount Everest right to the top, your hands and legs are frozen, you can barely breathe, and your limbs feel heavy, heavy, heavy. But what if I told you that this mountain was built upon lies and false promises? I think our fans of The Witcher expect an active roller coaster for eight episodes. The short stories really are the foundation of our world, so it was important to me to stick with that. You know, we always go back to the books as our main source. In season two, we can just relax and actually tell some fun stories. You see, season 2 didn't actually need a deathless mother. It didn't need a new villain, because it already had one. The biggest arch nemesis, quite literally the final boss of the circus they call The Witcher, is none other than... Hi, I'm Lauren schmidt Hisrick, showrunner and executive producer of The Witcher. Her relationship with the fans has gotten so bad that there was even a petition to replace her. So you might be asking, where did all of this go wrong? To understand this intricate battle between the good and evil forces, we 
Prima start at the Genesis, right at the beginning of The Witcher. So, let's channel the chaos and move back time. It is the December 8th of 2017. Lauren is announced as the showrunner of The Witcher, and the reception of this choice by Netflix was a bit mixed. Some people pointed out that the show she worked in the past, The Defenders, wasn't great. People became cautious and wary, yet there was some optimism within the ranks. From this point, the show was on. On the 29th of the same month, she retweeted an encouraging tweet. A random fan dragged her for it, but she responded with grace, saying that she intends not to screw the adaptation up. It was a small gesture, but it was powerful enough to begin build some trust with the fans. Boom kaboom and it is already the January 3rd of 2018. Lauren builds more rapport with the fans. Some even begin to validate her as a showrunner by stating that she, quote, gets it. Through 2018, she continues to tease the fans with excerpts from the pilot, as well as character descriptions and interviews. The fans seem to be enjoying her involvement. And now we arrive at September of 2018. Henry Cavill is cast as Geralt. The hype has never been higher. Lauren is officially the best showrunner to exist on planet Earth. Some people get butthurt that Lauren is poking fun at people who don't want to diversify the cast. Lauren decides to take a break from social media, allegedly because people begin harassing her. They're whining about a potentially black Cirilla, but those are quickly shut down and the hype continues. We come to October 29th of 2019. The trailer for the first season drops, and it officially slaps. People love it. Lauren does an interview afterwards, and if you weren't sold on her before, you are sold on her now. This hype train reaches its climax during Lauren's AMA on Reddit. All that is missing is a shrine for Lauren, and she would be a certified goddess. Other subreddits begin making fun of this overwhelming love for Lauren, but they are haters, they don't understand shit. The release date of The Witcher Season 1 is approaching, and it is game time, motherfuckers. People binge the show in masses, everyone and their mother's mother are glued to screens. The show does spectacular numbers. The show isn't without its problems, but that doesn't matter, because Lauren goes on Twitter to secure her spot as the best showrunner. She talks to the fans and addresses the problems. She says that she hears them and that she will improve. Some people make comparisons with Game of Thrones and its showrunners, once again securing Lauren on her pedestal. Still. Some people create amazing irony without even knowing it. Not long after, it is January of 2020. Lauren begins hyping up season 2. Uh, uh oh, and what is that? In February, some dark clouds appear in our Eden. The petition is created, with Lauren's name misspelled, and a picture that looks like it was stolen from an old Facebook account. They point out their grievances in the petition. Some people catch on, but it is still mostly dismissed as juvenile hate. We get further into 2020. People stay home for coronavirus. There are fears a rapidly spreading virus has reached Australia. This Reasons, and have a lot of time to think over the adaptation. Very coherently written posts from book fans spread all over the internet. People begin poking holes in the previous interviews with Lauren. The wait between season 1 and season 2 proves to be an amazing breeding ground for criticism. Suddenly, people begin to question Lauren's capabilities as a showrunner. December 13th of 2021 rolls around. Just a couple of days away from the release of season 2, Lauren continues her campaign to market the show to the fans. She even goes as far as to say that there is a 7 season plan in that. Oh, I just think there's so much material that I don't feel the need to start inventing my own to keep it going. But you see, Lauren is a funny woman. She has a sense of humor. Just a few days previously, on the December 10th, during an interview, she claimed this. This season, we probably deviated more from the books than we ever will again. She's one funny woman, isn't she? And of course, only one of these statements was true. And it wasn't the one the fans would have preferred. And it is another launch day. Once again, we are about to take off. It is December 17th, and season 2 finally drops. And this is where the fandom realized that they were being played. They had a look in the mirror. And ooh, what is that? Is that makeup? on their face? Oh yes, because they were clowned. Meanwhile, Lauren had dug out quite a grave to bury the lifeless body of the source material. And befitting a death, we had some stages of grief. We got to see anger and even bargaining. Petitions to remove her from the showrunner's position resurfaced. Lauren got on Twitter to defend her choices, but the damage already was done. She found herself in the middle of an angry mob of fans. And this, my friends, is where we are today. With a showrunner who was so hyped up having fallen low from her former glory, she had indeed become the ultimate villain to the book fans. So now let me point out a few things. One, you cannot deny that she herself had put herself in this position of contention. No one was forcing her to say those statements. No one forced her to do any of that. And I think that was a big mistake on her part, because she allowed the fans to be so attached to her and glorify her. And also, she kept promising more and more stuff. She rose those expectations, and then she proceeded to publicly lie about what the show was, and even flip-flop about it. And you cannot blame the fans entirely for their expectations. It also didn't help her case that she approved this little moment to be included in season 2. Although, 
you don't mind me saying so, that one, it's, uh, it's not your strongest. It took me to the fourth verse to understand there were different timelines. Oh, did it? Wow. <laughs> and that magic kiss, that was a bit cheap. Yeah? I spotted the dragon reveal a mile away. Well, you know, if you could write yourself a little song, but you can't. To be just, maybe you are grateful to be entertained. If you are not as fluent in the language of bullshit, allow me to translate. What she means to say is that, fuck you to the people who criticize me, you can't write better so suck it up, this show is great and you are wrong. But Lauren Bestie, let me break something to you. This shit? isn't cute. This isn't as smart and tongue-in-cheek as you think it is. This is not the moment. You are not the moment. So yeah, as it turns out, she's also a bit arrogant. Personally, I like to think of her as the definition of confidently incorrect, because the way she talks about the characters and her writing, it's like she thinks she's the next Shakespeare, a person who has cracked the secrets of storytelling. She seems to think that she has a tight grip over the Witcher books, like her galaxy brain and the Witcher universe is one and the same, and she does deserve some constructive criticism for that, but there is no need to send hate towards Lauren, because nobody deserves that. Either way, most fans have already lost all confidence in the show and in Lauren. The damage has been done, and the mountain had crumbled. She can see that she won't deviate from the books this much anymore, but I think that the future seasons now cannot be without changes. She can say that the show honors the books all she wants, but the show's trajectory is inevitably different, and this sort of flip-flopping mentality on behalf of of the showrunner can be seen through the show itself. I think that the show is a bit of a hybrid of nonsense, because on one hand it seeks to appeal to the widest audience, but the way the show goes about things feels like the intention is different, because as I have pointed out before, the lore of the show itself is very poorly explained. It is as if they expect the viewers to know the lore, as if they have the expectation that people who watch the show are already fans. And I could say the same thing about the reveal of Amir, it feels like their rationale could have been, eh, fuck it. They already know who the guy is, so let's reveal him. So it is sort of constructed in a way that only a book reader could completely understand the show, but also at the same time they are bending over backwards to get most viewers they can. So we end up having this weird undecided mess that thinks it is catering to the fans but is actually an insult to the books. But at the end of the day, you can slam the showrunner all you want. You can criticize her choices and her mistakes with handling the show. But let's get a nice dose of reality here. Here are some facts. First, the Witcher franchise has been very successful on Netflix. You cannot deny that. And second, whether you like it or not, it is headed by Lauren, which makes her a very valuable asset to Netflix. There is a reason why she signed a deal with them. It was still this woman who brought in all that cash. So you can create petitions all you want, not that they actually work, but the truth is that it won't change anything. And I am sure that for the most people it isn't news. But I still do think this needs to be said. Netflix is interested in big lumps of cash, not in catering to a niche audience, so there is that. And there is no need to send any hate towards her, again nobody deserves that. You just won't achieve anything through yelling at the creative team on the internet. The most you can do is vote with your wallet, or with your eyes in this instance, and just stop watching the show. It isn't that hard. Well, I don't know about you, but I am tired of the show. I don't have any confidence in it. Will I watch the third season? Sure, probably, but my expectations are extremely low now. That is not to say that you cannot enjoy it. Please do enjoy it if you can. After all, that is why it was made. Anyways, if you liked the video, please click on the like button and also please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out on any future content. Once again, I want to thank you for being here and I will see you next time.